Welcome back everyone. This video would be about the basic process involved in DNA replication. Before we proceed with the topic at hand, let me first introduce to you the central dogma used in molecular biology, and that is from DNA going to RNA going to protein. And these are the processes that we need to remember, replication, transcription, and translation. So what are the differences in these processes? When a DNA is used as a template to create more DNA, this process is called as replication. But when a DNA is used as a template to create or synthesize RNA, we call this process as transcription. And when the synthesis protein is directed by the RNA, we call this process as translation. And in this video, we will be talking about the DNA replication process. Let's now discuss the process of DNA replication. DNA replication has three stages. First one is initiation, followed by elongation, and the end is termination. Initiation involves the licensing of origins of replication to create two replication forks. Now, these might be big words for you right now, but I want you to remember that initiation is involved with the licensing, the origins of replication, and the creation of replication forks. We will be discussing these further as we go along. The second stage is elongation, and this is the actual synthesis of nascent DNA. And when we say nascent, we are referring to the new DNA strand that will be formed in this process. And termination simply means the end of DNA replication. Let's now talk about initiation, and as mentioned earlier, it has something to do with the origin of replication and licensing. Let's start with the origin of replication, which is sometimes abbreviated as ORI, and this refers to the distinct position where the DNA replication can begin. So that means in the whole DNA sequence, there would only be a part of the sequence that is considered as the origin of replication, and this is where DNA replication should start. It will not start in any other parts of the DNA sequence. An origin of replication would usually have a high ANT base pair concentration because of the fact that ANT only has two hydrogen bonds that connect them to each other, so that means less energy for the DNA to consume or to use, unlike with the C and the G base pairs, which has three hydrogen bonds that link them together. In prokaryotes, there is usually just one origin of replication. Some organisms have two, but most of them only have one in its circular DNA. An E. coli specifically has an origin of replication made up of 245 base pairs. So that means an origin of replication can have hundreds of sequences of base pairs. In eukaryotes, so this is one difference of the prokaryotes in eukaryotes, eukaryotes would have multiple origins or multiple origin of replication sites because of the length of the DNA sequence, which is usually longer than a prokaryote. So it would have more than one site of replication. So that means more than one site of origin of replication. And in humans, there is an estimated 20,000 origin of replications in the DNA. The second concept under initiation is licensing, and this is the term given when there is a permission for DNA replication to begin. This is done by different licensing factors. And this licensing usually occurs in the late M phase, so the late phase of mitosis, or the early phase in G1. This is where the licensing happens, which is part of initiation, right before the DNA replication in the S phase begins. 
The second stage is elongation, and this is the phase where the actual creation or the synthesis of the new polynucleotide for the DNA is made. In this video, we can see the synthesis of the new strand of the DNA using the template DNA strand. And right before elongation happens, we will see the formation of the replication bubble and the replication fork. When we say replication bubble, this is due to the unwinding or sometimes referred to as the melting of the double-stranded DNA because of the separation of the two DNA strands creating a space or a bubble in the DNA sequence. This would give space for the creation of the new polynucleotide. And inside this bubble is the replication fork. Sometimes uh, diagrammed as such, this replication fork will continue to grow as the process of replication progresses. The elongation stage has four steps, and there are four enzymes responsible for these steps. The first one is the helicase, which is responsible for unwinding and separating the DNA strands. The next enzyme is the primase, which anneals the RNA primer. The third enzyme is the DNA polymerase, which is responsible for replicating the DNA molecule. And lastly, we have the ligase, which connects the DNA strands together. So in short, elongation consists of first unwinding or unzipping the double-stranded DNA into two single-stranded DNA, care of the helicase. After that, a primase will come in to anneal a primer or to attach a primer which will signify where the replication will start. Once a primer is attached, the DNA polymerase can now come in so that it can do the replication process. These are our actual workers that does the replication. And after that, a ligase would come in, which is considered as the glue in the elongation process to make sure that the gaps in between the fragments that were created are fixed together. The first step in the elongation stage uses the enzyme helicase, which creates the replication fork. This enzyme is also the one that promotes the melting, unzipping, or the unwinding of the double-stranded DNA. It does this by breaking the hydrogen bonds that link the two polynucleotides together. As mentioned in the previous video, the nitrogenous bases are connected with hydrogen bonds. A and T have two hydrogen bonds, while C and G are connected with three hydrogen bonds. So the main job of the helicase is to break these hydrogen bonds so that the two polynucleotides may be separated from each other. This will expose the DNA sequences that are needed for replication. One problem that may occur in this step is that the separated strands may anneal with each other again, or sometimes the single strand may have complementary strands that will self-anneal, and either of these problems will give a unsuccessful replication. So to prevent this from happening, we have the SSB proteins or the single-stranded binding proteins. The role of these proteins is to make sure that the single-stranded DNA that have been separated will be kept separate during the entire replication process. It will also prevent the self-annealing of these single strands. So it will stabilize the strands during the replication process. Another problem that may be encountered in this step is what we call as the torsional resistance. This happens as the helicase tries to unwind the DNA. Tension builds up in the upper strand. And to prevent this, we have the topoisomerase enzyme. It's this one. So this keeps the DNA from supercoiling. So as the helicase goes forward, the DNA strand on the upper strand does not supercoil. 
The next step in the elongation process involves the use of an enzyme called primase. And the role of the primase is first to create an RNA primer and then should be able to anneal or connect this primer into the newly separated DNA strand care of the helicase. The importance of the RNA primer created by the primase is that the next enzyme, which is the DNA polymerase, would need this RNA primer so that it can start replicating the DNA. That's why sometimes the primase is referred to as the initializer because it is needed to start the replication or the actual replication of the DNA. An RNA primer is usually made up of 5 to 10 nucleotides and is complementary to the template DNA or to the DNA strand that has just been separated. The next step in elongation uses the enzyme DNA polymerase, which is referred to as the builder in DNA replication, because this is the enzyme that builds or creates the new strand. It does this by adding nucleotides with A, C, G, or T. One downfall of the DNA polymerase is that it needs a primer, but luckily this issue has already been resolved by the previous enzyme, which is primase. So as primase attaches an RNA primer, this gives a go signal to where the DNA polymerase can start attaching nucleotides to create the new strand. Another downfall of the DNA polymerase is that it can only build from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. That means it can only attach to the 3' prime end of the template. To discuss this better, let's look at this diagram. So let's say the one in red is our original DNA that has been separated by our helicase, and this is the DNA that we should replicate. And as mentioned before, a DNA is anti-parallel, meaning that one strand runs from the 3' prime to the 5' prime direction, and the other strand runs from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. One strand is known as the leading strand, so that's 3' prime to 5' prime, and the other strand is known as the lagging strand, which is the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. Let's now discuss how they got these names. The leading strand has a continuous process. Since the DNA polymerase can only build from the 5' prime, it should attach to the 3' prime end of the template. As the primer is added, the DNA polymerase can start building or adding nucleotides. So as the helicase opens up some more, it can just continue to build until the DNA replication should be stopped. On the other hand, the lagging strand does more work. Since it should only build from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction, it should then start attaching to the 3' prime end of the template. So let's say that the helicase was able to open up this area first. So a primer would be added here, and the DNA polymerase will start building until it is stopped. Let's use the picture above for better understanding. So let's say that the helicase was able to open up up to this side first. So an RNA primer will be attached and it will build until this portion. And then as the helicase opens up some more, it will build another primer and then add more nucleotides by the DNA polymerase and this will continue on and on. So as the helicase opens up some more, another primer will be added and the DNA polymerase will start building until it is stopped by the previous segment. Now these fragments are what we call as the Okazaki fragments. Because of the Okazaki fragments, the creation of the new strand is 
discontinuous and there is a repeated primer annealing and because of this because of the multiple primers remember primers are RNA and we should change these into DNA and the one responsible for doing this would be the DNA polymerase 1. Each Okazaki fragments are usually made up of 100 to 200 base pairs. And the last step in elongation uses the enzyme ligase, which is known as our glue for DNA replication because it has the job of sealing the gaps in the lagging strand. Remember, in the lagging strand, we have the Okazaki fragments and there are spaces in between these fragments. So the ligase is the one responsible for connecting all of these fragments together so we can have one continuous DNA strand. And finally, we have the last stage, which is termination. And sadly, this stage is less well understood compared to initiation and elongation. But most commonly, termination happens when the replication forks meet each other. So let's say we have our DNA here with multiple sites of um, origin of replication. So here, and then the replication bubble forms with the replication forks and then elongation stage happens. And as the elongation happens, they are bound to meet each other. And when, the, when this happens, the termination of replication will happen and we end up with two DNA strands and as the semi-conservative method suggests one of the strands would have a template and a new strand and the other will have the same with the template and the new strand. There are several differences in the DNA replication of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Some of the ones that we should mention would be the difference in their site, the Okazaki fragments, the time of DNA replication, and the process itself. For the prokaryote, DNA replication happens in the cytoplasm since prokaryotes do not have any nucleus. In the eukaryotes, on the other hand, replication happens inside the nucleus. The Okazaki fragments of prokaryotes are longer compared to the ones made in eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotes are able to copy 1,500 to 2,000 base pairs per second compared to eukaryotes that can only copy around 100 to 200 base pairs maximum per second. That's why bacteria can replicate faster than eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic DNA replication is more complex compared to a prokaryote for several reasons. The eukaryotic cell has more DNA compared to bacteria, for example. Another one is that the eukaryotic DNA is complexed with nucleosomes. Remember, our DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, making chromosomes, and so on. And lastly, Eukaryotic um, DNA is linear compared to a circular prokaryotic DNA. And to make up for this, to be able to facilitate rapid synthesis of large quantities of DNA, the eukaryotic chromosomes do contain multiple, as mentioned earlier, sites of origin of replication. That's why in the end, a eukaryotic cell can still replicate an entire genome in just a few minutes or even hours. And that ends our discussion about the basic process of DNA replication. Thank you very much for watching.